Hello and welcome to this video on gain of function research. This is a collection of techniques that have gained a lot of traction recently. Unfortunately, that attention seems to focus on only a specific application and circumstances which do not necessarily reflect the true purpose and utility in gain of function research. Scientists use a variety of techniques to modify organisms depending on the properties of the organism itself and the end goal. Some of these methods involve directly making changes at the level of genetic code. Others may involve placing organisms in environments that select for functions linked to these genetic changes. The process of waiting for a wild type of organism to acquire these traits is long, based on luck, and largely improbable. The only way to be certain of these traits showing up is to artificially implant them into the organism in question. This is ideal if we're talking about something like drought or pest-resistant crops. In some cases, it could be used to add a function such as metabolizing plastic waste, or to gain antibiotic resistance. Both of these are very useful in the development of new medicines and the creation of novel ways to effectively recycle waste. It can even have a role in the creation of biofuels such as ethanol. Gain of function is not just for development of pathogens. For this video, let's consider several examples. One being the role of E. coli in insulin production. Another, the role of gain of function research in antibiotic prospecting. Then we have examples of the use of gain of function in selecting for certain organisms and the creation of models of disease and research animals. We've previously described how you can modify certain microorganisms to produce insulin. Notably in the early days, this was E. coli. It required a number of changes. The most important for our purposes is that we have placed human genes into the E. coli. This produces human insulin. Unlike early methods, this produced both human insulin, which is genetically and proteomically unique from bovine, mouse, and porcine insulin, and when you take this insulin and put it in a human, it works perfectly without the adverse effects seen with insulin from other animals. Now that there is a stable organism making insulin, you can change it to create different kinds of insulin. Long-lasting and long-acting are just two examples. It allows for customization and development of specialization treatments. The insulin gene would never have had any reason to occur or be transmitted to the E. coli, and so the only way for this to happen was for that functionality to be added. In a similar vein, you must think about pathogens overall. For this, let's start with an example organism, but still sitting with E. coli this time creating a lab-made version of the E. coli strain that has acquired the Shigella toxin gene. This has occurred in nature, but getting a sample can be difficult and is somewhat unnecessary under the circumstances. Instead, the laboratory can make an E. coli strain that has the same Shigella toxin being produced. They can then begin to experiment. This includes how the gene is transferred, what benefit it provides to the E. coli, what genes need to accompany it, and more. Understanding what advantages having this Shigella toxin gene helps us to understand just why E. coli has picked it up. Notable examples are greater competitiveness against other bacteria, but also the fact that it has increased spread as a result. By using gain-of-function research, we're able to create a simile of the wild-type E. coli that is causing a lot of health problems. It allows us to then explore how to deal with the problem and what it is. It's not simply something we have to encounter in the clinical setting and then try and wrestle with without any knowledge. In more practical terms, gain-of-function research is used to create antibiotic-resistant bacteria. This is often done in conjunction with other modifications. By only acquiring antibiotic resistance if the bacterium gets the intended gene 2 that's being modified, we ensure that they can then be selected for. This gives you the opportunity to apply an antibiotic 
and that will kill any bacterium that has not been modified. You can then use the isolated strain of modified bacteria. For instance, what about if you're trying to investigate certain proteins being produced? Well, the only way to know for sure that those proteins are being produced, or at least the genes being inserted, is to attach some sort of marker that allows you to select for them. A common experiment in laboratories is the green fluorescent protein. The bacteria will glow under a black light. That's the fluorescent protein. The only way to be sure that the bacterium have that is to combine the agar plate with antibiotics along with the nutrients necessary for the bacterium to grow by killing those bacteria that don't have the green fluorescent protein gene and the antibiotic resistant gene you're able to select only those that are going to produce the protein in question. This novel strain can then be used to test genetic mutations. This same approach, let's say, can be used to test novel antibiotics. You take your bacterium and you put the antibiotic resistant genes for different antibiotics or families of antibiotics into the bacterium. Or in some cases, it could be unrelated genes that by virtue of what they are impart the same sort of resistance. For example, certain genes associated with the metabolism of completely unrelated materials inadvertently provide protection to antibiotics. The application of these will go on, but they're just a few examples of how you can use it in a more direct and simple system. And now for animal models, and this is where things get both controversial and complicated. This might seem controversial, but animal research is necessary at the moment in certain contexts. We simply do not have adequate models to use in lieu of animals. There are promising leads, but they're not there yet. These animals have historically not been a great replacement for humans. This is because of the genetic and physiological differences. Gain of function can be a means of mitigating this particular problem. For example, there are a very wide range of rodent models that can help to replicate the circumstances and genes of a human body during hypertension and other cardiovascular diseases. This allows for the creation of disease models that replicate all the changes that occur in the human body in the mouse. There's also instances where we've used mice and rats as a replacement for the human brain. Neurological diseases, Alzheimer's and similar, can all be replicated in the mouse brain, and so by using the rodent model with the human gene and making the necessary tweaks to the genome, we can recreate the environment necessary for a disease. In other cases, we might want to make an animal vulnerable to a human pathogen, for example, influenza. This is done to test the safety of vaccines before it can be distributed on a large scale. In fact, most vaccines and treatments to a certain extent will require animal testing before they ever get near a human clinical trial. By adding human genes for receptors, function, and overall physiological processes, the mouse can become vulnerable to the influenza virus, among other diseases. This allows for testing of the efficacy of the vaccine or other treatment. This same technique can be used to estimate how well the disease will spread. The same genes may also be used to find out how a disease spreads and how it infects the human body, or in fact any animal system. For example, do you want to know how a virus gets into a horse, or a cow, a pig, or something similar? Do you want to investigate how certain parasites or other pathogens get into an animal? This is one way to do it, and not only can you use it to find out how the parasitical pathogen gets into the animal, but specific circumstances, such as malaria into red blood cells. There are other ways to conduct gain-of-function research. The major methods include iterative generations being grown under certain conditions. This is primarily under conditions which promote mutation. Notably in the early days, atomic gardening was an instance of this. So no, gain-of-function is not just for pathogens. It's simply a noteworthy occurrence at the moment. 
in general, there is a general call for transparency and safety around any laboratory that is conducting gain-of-function research, and more so on anything that's working with highly pathogenic organisms. We will have a video on specifically what is required for these different facilities, let's say. As for concerns that governments or similar might abuse the various methods available for gain of function, well, to start with, there's always going to be some bad actor. Transparency and peer review are some of the first lines of defense for this sort of thing. That's why the CRISPR baby debacle was so roundly decried as a terrible thing. Further to that, there are limitations placed on certain facilities and what they can do. This is based on funding allowances and so on. There's also certain research that is banned based on ethical principles. All of that assumes an open society where such access to information is possible. Where you have closed societies or research that isn't made known, there's no way to really either identify it or stop it. That does not, however, mitigate the not insignificant number of benefits that are both available now and will be going forwards into the future based on the ability to modify an organism to gain new functions, and many of these functions are either useful in producing products or understanding how a pathogen works and how we can stop it from working, thereby improving people's lives and developing novel treatments. Thank you for watching this video. If you have found it interesting, consider liking, sharing, and subscribing. Please post any comments, questions, or suggestions that you have below.